Okay, here we go. Uh, here is one more material on my channel, Discover Social Sciences. Uh, this is... Uh, I, I don't know if I can call it special, but it is certainly different from a few past updates uh, uh, that I made, because so far I was making sort of a video update on YouTube connected with the written update on my uh, scientific blog, Discover Social Sciences. This is a little bit different, because that video that you are watching is sort of a standalone educational material. Uh, if you click, in a moment we'll, you will see a reminder about it, if you click uh, on the long link below the video in the description box, you can download the full PowerPoint presentation uh, with the contents of that video as a sort of notes. Uh, but there is no written update on my Discover Social Sciences blog strictly corresponding to this video update. Huh? Nevertheless, I strongly encourage you to visit my blog. Maybe you can find some interesting ideas there. So here we go. So the topic of uh, that material is the P times Q or the price times quantity uh, material uh, or model in economic sciences, it is by experience I know that especially when I deal with beginners, with the students of like first year or second year, uh, that specific logic of price times quantity uh, is a bit of a problem for my students. It is hard to understand how social phenomena can be reduced uh, to that simple arithmetical product P times Q or price times quantity. So in this video, I want to break it down like step by step. I want to show some underlying logic and I want to show a computational application of that logic. So here we go. The price times Q is, a, or price times a quantity is a fundamental concept. Huh? Fundamental, it means that, that uh, there is like it carries over many different chapters. Huh? If you read a textbook in microeconomics or in macroeconomics, you will see that price quantity combination in many places. Uh, so, in this respect, it is a fundamental concept. Once again, I know by experience that some students have hard times understanding it. Uh, so, but this is really a a fundamental video, a fundamental teaching that I am delivering in this video. And try to consider it as something fundamental. So first of all, the application. Uh, the application of that P times Q logic that I am going to focus on in this educational video is especially in macroeconomics. So when we talk about entire countries, uh, there is also an application of the same logic, price times the quantity, in business planning. It really serves, I know it. Uh, for example, if you go uh, onto the site of my blog, so if you go discoversocialsciences.com, you can find a link uh, called uh, the business planning uh, calculator or the business planner. Uh, there you will find an Excel workbook which is specifically based on the on that logic price times quantity. Uh, so essentially we talk about macroeconomics. So we talk about big social entities the size of countries. Of course we remember that countries are of different size. Huh? There is China and there is the Princedom of Liechtenstein as uh, in that slide that I am um, talking below of. Uh, but uh, essentially, we talk about macroeconomics, about countries. Why is it important? It is important because of complexity. I'm going to break it down in the subsequent slides. So essentially, uh, macroeconomics can be perceived as a science of reducing social complexity down to simple numbers. Uh, why do we do it? Uh, our human societies are complex. And we know by historical experience that the more complexity we build in our society, 
uh, the wealthier that society is. Uh, so it means that the greater percentage of its members are relatively well off. I say relatively because, of course, I know there are social inequalities. Sometimes those social inequalities are really pungent, are really painful. Yet, the more complex a society we build, the better off uh, the majority of its citizens can be. So we can say that we humans, we have the capacity to produce stability, safety and something like material opulence through complexity in our social relations. Huh? It is very important, especially regarding that Q component of that price times quantity model. Hmm? And uh, here comes like a piece of social wisdom. Uh, we can call it a, sty a stylized fact of economics. It, uh, you can take any randomly chosen piece of social life, of complex social relations. If you observe that piece of social relations, that set of social relations for, us, uh, for a moment, you, will s you can guess that those relations, those people involved in those relations, generate a certain amount of utility, aggregate utility. Utility is what I can get out of, for example, a microphone that I am using right now. Utility is something I get out of the food I buy at the store. Utility is something I get out, for example, of the house I live in. Hmm? That's aggregate utility of all the things that we make and do. Hmm? And the greater that aggregate utility, uh, the more we can accomplish as a society. Uh, so the uh, sort of the faster we can move around, the faster we can adapt to changing conditions. For example, you can uh, observe a society of primitive hunters gatherers as one of those tribes in the Amazon rainforest. And you can see that whatever the external conditions, for example, uh, whatever the pressure from plantators on cutting the jungle, uh, those uh, hunters gatherers essentially behave in the same way and they adapt very slowly. In our, what we could call the consumer capitalistic societies, whatever kind of mistakes we make, whatever kind of weaknesses we have in, the, in that society, as we produce a lot of economic utility, we can adapt much faster. You can see it, for example, by the spread of electronics and the digital technologies. So here comes a mental experiment that I am encouraging you to perform just as, uh, as a kind of intermezzo in that uh, in that lecture, in the educational material on the price times quantity logic. So, the mental experiment consists in distinguishing the easily observable components of social life from the non-apparent and harder to observe components. So, in the first step, take any group of people you know. Someone from among your family, your neighbors, business partners, customers, whoever. Then, Ask yourself, what can you know, what do you know about those people like by straight observation of their behavior, of their actions, of their attributes? So what can you like say or claim about those people on the grounds of the apparent things you do? By apparent things, I mean the things that you can observe, that you can like see. And then, once you nail down what you do know about them, try to think, try to ask yourself what you don't know about them and how important is, the, is what you don't know. So, uh, when you realize what you don't know about those people, ask yourself, would you like to know more about them. So, like, would you like to know uh, what's like behind their behavior, behind their apparent actions? 
Now, if you are a government or if you do business, very frequently you can find yourself in a situation when guessing accurately uh, something about people is more important than what you can directly observe about it uh, or uh, about them. I, I, am, I am sorry. So uh, that's a very important idea behind that price times quantity logic. You will see it that in social relations there are things that we can immediately see about other people and there are things that we really don't see that we just guess and uh, if we think about it those non-apparent things that we have to guess are frequently more important, especially when we want to predict what those people will do in the future. So we go from that mental experiment, we go even further into some sort of philosophical thinking. Uh, social phenomena are so complex to us that actually, de facto, we perceive them as chaotic, as some sort of chaos in which we put just some very gross order just for the purpose of going from the sunrise to the sunset like in one coherent story. So we see people doing things but we usually don't see the underlying patterns and changing and changes in the way they do things. Huh? So we attach our attention to what is apparent, but we more or less subconsciously let go of all the underlying complexity. Now, one apparent thing that we observe about any social system is exchange. Uh, it can be barter or money-based, but exchange transactions. When we swap something, like I give you something, you give me something else, these are like very apparent uh, staple characteristics of any social system. And in the, and those exchanges, we know it once again by historical experience, those exchanges take typical patterned forms. And uh, those uh, typical forms are usually called contracts, or frequently they are called contracts or customs. And in those contracts, there are uh, some salient traits hmm, which are repetitive across many transactions. In the legal vocabulary, in the legal jargon, uh, it has a Latin name, Essentialia Negotii. Hmm? It is the pattern which is repetitive across many contracts, across many tra transactions. And among those patterns, among those essential components of exchange, there are prices. It is another piece of economic wisdom. Uh, you can, for example, read it uh, in that big treaty by Adam Smith about the wealth of nations that prices, when you observe prices, they are really informative about the way that people do business together. And here I give, uh, I know that the illustration I give here is a little bit gross. Uh, but I really didn't know how to represent it better. So here you, you can see the picture of a crowd in the street, of people in the street. I made like one continuous red circle. Mm. Uh, accidentally it is around the head of a man, but it doesn't have to do anything with his head or with this man. And that continuous red circle means that this is like the, the easily observable part of social reality. And that would correspond to prices. So prices are the easily observable part of the otherwise very complex social reality. And that uh, red uh, dashed irregular shape that you can see in that picture corresponds to everything that is much harder to observe, to everything that is essentially chaotic. And that everything else essentially chaotic would be the quantity or Q part in that price times quantity model. So here is something that you might be somehow familiar with if you have, for example, already some background in microeconomics. It is that two-dimensional manifold where you have a price on one axis and quantity on another one. Uh, 
In this case, I, uh, I am showing price on the horizontal and quantity on the vertical, but it really doesn't matter. Huh? It is just a two-dimensional manifold. In some textbooks, you can see price on the vertical and quantity on the horizontal. I, I, I don't mind. It is a, a matter of, of convention. So, the bottom line here is that uh, the price or the price axis represents what is easily observable in the social reality and the Q or quantity axis represents that chaotic, hardly observable part which we rather guess than know. And uh, in between those axes you can see that classical convex curve which uh, you might know from economic sciences as uh, the indifference curve. So, in the perspective that I'm developing here, a curve like this is like a bridge between what is easily known and easily observable, so the price component, and what is harder to observe and essentially chaotic, so the quantity component. Now we go further and we make an important assumption about the price component of economic relations, of economic transactions. It is something that you can observe if you invest a little bit in the stock market. Prices can be averaged across similar transactions. So if we can divide the economy of the entire country into like sets of similar transactions. Inside each of such sets, we can average prices. Uh, and uh, what do I mean by similar enough when I talk about those similar enough goods or similar enough transactional prices? Similar enough means that those prices move together in more or less the same direction and at more or less the same pace. That's the definition of a sectoral price. Each such sector in the economy has a gross nominal income, which is essentially equal to the average price practiced in that sector times the quantity of economic utility that gets traded in that sector. You can see that the gross nominal income can be reduced to the acronym GNI, which accidentally comes the same as gross national income. And it is not, and it is not really accidental, it is deliberate because uh, the gross national income is like the bottom line mm, uh, below all the gross nominal incomes generated by all particular sectors of the economy. So here you have a classical division of an economy into three sectors, services, agriculture and industrial. Each of them is uh, endowed with a certain price level. So it means that these are, this is the average price level. And in each of those sectors, we have a certain quantity of economic utility that is being made and traded. And the bottom line under all those sectors is the gross national income or the GNI. Uh, the division of economy into three sectors, industrial, agriculture and services, is precisely based on the specificity of transactions. In the industrial sector and in the services sector, simply the assets that you use in transactions are slightly different from those used in agriculture.
So here we go once again with that manifold price quantity. So two axes, two dimensions, price and quantity. And here comes another observation, like another stylized fact of economics. Prices change faster than quantities. Uh, in that curve, in the picture, you can see that there are like two tails or two wings, which are a little bit uneven, bumpy or ragged. These are like the ragged paths of development where uh, quantities and prices adapt to each other. That's the path of long-term economic development. And in the middle, you have that flat line, that flat window of changing prices uh, with the same quantity. So that's the short-term change. Uh, why is it so? Prices are the product of bargaining, very largely. We negotiate, we bargain, and so we fix the transactional prices. But the volume of production or the volume of economic utility we generate, the Q component, it changes as we accumulate productive assets. So it changes at a much slower pace. Now, when you are a government, and I talk about governments because, in my opinion, macroeconomics serve mostly governments. Uh, so, when you are a government, you want to predict your future tax base. And you want to predict your future tax base as accurately as possible. Uh, once again, there is that historical observation that if you want to make like a good country a solid, relatively stable political structure, if you want your people to work on predictable jobs, if you want your businesses to run in predictable markets, uh, you need a predictable tax base. Mm. And you need to be sort of wise about that future expected tax base. Mm. Uh, what you have as a government in terms of economic statistics uh, is usually the gross national income. So the sum total of sectoral gross incomes. So essentially a product average price times the quantity. And uh, predicting the future tax base involves a reverse engineering that gross national income. So the art here consists in shaving off the change in, in prices or inflation in order to extract the change in real output. Um, because we know once again by historical experience that what makes a good tax base is a consistent, long-term, steady growth in real output. So, on the long run, what we would like to have is a steady, repetitive delta Q. So, this is what we want, but here comes the paradox. That real output Q is so complex and heterogeneous by nature that it is very hard to observe. It is essentially unobservable as such. Uh, and here also comes the, like, the big contention in the modern economics, especially when we talk about environment, about climate change. Everything we know about the history of human civilization tells us that a developed society can be built on the base of a steadily growing real output. But the question is, can we make our real output grow uh, infinitely? Hmm? There is a limit, because this planet has a limit of capacity. So how to build a society which doesn't need a steady long-term delta Q? 
Okay, so here is another uh, piece of uh, philosophy or something at the limit of philosophy and uh, mathematics. So question, how to extract something unobservable from something observable? And the answer has been essentially given already by Isaac Newton. We can uh, extract something unobservable from something observable by observing change rather than stationary states. So this is the Newtonian principle in science that any state of nature can be studied as change in another integral state of nature. Uh, it corresponds to a cognitive mechanism in us, humans. So it corresponds to the fact that in our perception we essentially glide over the real stuff of reality and we observe rather gradients of change than absolute states. Think about how you perceive colors, for example. You perceive colors by distinguishing one color from another. Hmm? So, uh, when you are a government, you use that Newtonian principle in order to extract information about real output from the information that you have about the gross national income. It is a little bit as if you had a mathematical refinery. You want to separate the light fraction price from the heavy fraction Q. Hmm? Okay, so here comes a numerical example. So let's practice. Uh, here we have the distinction between three sectors in the economy. So, services, agriculture, industrial. In the services sector, we have quick short-term growth in prices and steady real output. So, it is like a state when, for example, uh, the attractiveness of some kind of services grows quickly. For example, digital, uh, digital technologies sold as services, for example, communication services. So the price grows, but the output stays the same in the short run. And here you can see the immediate application of that price times quantity logic. Price 500 times quantity 2000 gives us a P times Q product equal to 1 million. Hmm. Uh, those numbers in the table are just units of some imaginary currency. You can put it whatever you want. You can put it, or, or you can put here dollars, euros, uh, yuans, yens, Swiss francs, whatever you want. Uh, each of the sectors generates a certain gross income, which at the bottom line gets summed up. So in the period T0, the earlier one, we have the total gross national income of 2,400,000 and uh, in the period T1, the later one, the consecutive one, we have a gross national income of uh, 3,020,000. So 3,020,000, once again. Uh, in the sector of agriculture, we can see steady prices and big growth in real output. And uh, in the sector of industrial activities, we can see slight growth in prices and slight growth in real output. And when you see this data, you could ask a legitimate question. Why the hell do we do all that intellectual, intellectual gymnastics with extracting quantity from the price times Q product if we have those quantities already given. Yes, we have them given, but these are quantities of hardly comparable things. For example, you have a quantity of services, a quantity of agricultural goods and the quantity of industrial goods. If we added up just quantities, we would be adding up apples to oranges. So, then we go back to the bottom line once again. And you can see that at the bottom line, the gross national income of that imaginary economy has grown by 
620,000 units of currency or by 25%. So now we go a little bit more mathematical. I am speaking this time from the nominator uh, level of that big fraction. The first step or the first assumptions we make uh, is that this nominal growth of 620,000 units is the combination of two processes. There is a change in prices, in aggregate prices, and there is a change in quantities. And we want to separate those two. So we calculate something that is called the compound price index or CPI. Uh, incidentally, once again, the acronym, the CPI, is the same as you can see in many economic reports under the name of Consumer Price Index. It is not an accident. I do it deliberately because it is the same methodology. The Consumer Price Index is essentially made according to the same methodology as the Compound Price Index that I present here. So, uh, in the denominator of the big fraction from above which I am speaking, you have something that can, be called, that can be called the contribution of a given sector to the gross national income. So, I take the gross income of the sector, the average price level in that sector, times the quantity of goods in that sector, uh, in this case, in the period T0. And I divide that sectoral contribution by the gross national income. I get a decimal fraction, which represents the part of gross national income created, created in that specific sector. Uh, so the logic is that your price counts, your sectoral price counts as much as much bacon you bring to the common table. And the price level of the given sector gets divided by that, uh, by that contribution, by that percentage contribution. We do it for each sector separately. And then we sum it up. In a moment, in the next slide, you will see what does it give numerically. So here it comes. For each sector and in each period, you can see those uh, lilac purple percentages. For example, for the sector of services, it is 41.7% in the period T0. So those percentages are the denominators of the big fraction that you could see in the previous slide. These are the relative contributions of each sector to the gross national income at the given period, so at T0 or at T1. Then I multiply this percentage contribution by the price level of this specific sector at this given time. And it gives me the weighted component of the compound price index of the whole economy. And at the bottom line, you can see those component weighted prices summed up. And it gives you 253.33 in the period T0 and 252.38 in the period T1. So in terms of price change, what we have in that imaginary economy is essentially slight deflation. It's like minus 0.37%. And if you look well uh, into this table, like if you try to understand those numbers, you can see that when we compute a compound price index, we can capture structural change in the economy. In this case, the structural change consists in agriculture and industry taking a little bit away from services. 
And we have the last step, the final one. So we shave off the price change, the price component from the observable change in the gross national income. So we have uh, plus 25% of growth in the gross national income, nominally. This is the nominal economic growth. We keep in mind that we had that nominal economic growth in the presence of slight deflation, minus 0.37%. So now we go with that formula which I have immediately above me in that, in that scene. So you take in the denominator 1 plus the rate of nominal economic growth divided by 1 plus the change in compound price index and from that fraction you subtract 1. Subtracting 1 is here just a mathematical trick. Uh, you introduce 1 into the fraction in order to simplify your operations a little bit and then you don't need the 1 anymore so you kick it out by subtraction. So I have 1 plus 25% divided by 1 minus 0.37% minus 1, which gives me 1.25 divided by 0 0.9963, fraction minus 1, and at the end of the day it gives me a real economic growth of 25.5%. Okay, so this is it. This is the whole numerical example I wanted to give in order to illustrate uh, that whole principle of price times quantity. If you have any questions, you can, you can go on the page of my blog, discoversocialsciences.com. There, in any of my updates, you will find the email address to which you can address your questions or you can address your questions as comments to my blog. Anyway, I wish you like a nice afternoon today and under the COVID lockdown. And I hope this educational material has been useful. Bye.